Well, hello there, good people. Hi, it's Jason with Green Country Agroforestry here. Boy, it's Wednesday evening, later than usual, because we're trying to capture that that beneficial sunlight for just a little bit longer. I've uh, got the ducks put away and uh, get ready to do a little bit of chit-chatting tonight. It's a little bit off of the usual topic because we're going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking about some philosophy and not strictly gardening, but it's related to this fifty-seven some odd million square mile garden that we all live on. You know, surrounded on all four sides by water the way it was originally. Hmm. And of course, as being human beings, they have to coexist on this little mud ball. There's some things that we should probably talk about. Let's see. We got Mary driving off in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas. Katie Murray is with us tonight. Ken Jennings is with us tonight. Hello, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Um, let me see here. I was looking. At a uh, at an upload not too long ago, where somebody went over the shopping cart theory. I know I said shopping cart problem in the in the title for the video. It's actually the shopping cart theory. Um, somebody posted this anonymously uh, somewhere around March 2020, but it's since become viral. And of course, the shopping cart theory is a a test for whether a person is capable of being self governing. Get a sip of this Gatorade here. Hmm. I had to turn off that air conditioner because it was making the green screen ripple behind me. Let me read off the, the basic premise to you real quick here. Um, <clears throat> to return the shopping cart is an easy and convenient task, and one which we can all recognize as the correct and appropriate thing to do. Returning the shopping cart is objectively right. There aren't any situations other than a dire emergency which a person is not able to return their cart. At the same time, it's not illegal to abandon your shopping cart. There's no law that says you must return your shopping cart back to the corral or back to the store whenever you're done using it. You're not going to be penalized or punished for not doing it. There's also no, no immediate and obvious reward for, for returning the shopping cart. I suppose with the exception of the places where they, they have a quarter that's, that's there that you get the quarter out whenever you Whenever you return the cart, but usually in those cases, you didn't get the cart in the first place unless you put the quarter in. I think Aldi's does that. Some other places do it as well. So using the shopping cart and returning of a shopping cart is an example of whether a person will do what is right and expected, what's within the, the rules of decency without being forced to do it. Now, the original poster says you gain nothing by returning the shopping cart. Now, I disagree a little bit, and I'll get to that in a minute. Of course, this is where, where things get nuanced. You have to return the shopping cart out of the goodness of your own heart. You return it because it's the right thing to do, because it's correct. Now, the original poster that put this out went a little bit over the top and said that the person that can't do this is no better than an animal. They're an absolute savage who can only be made to do what's right by threatening them with the law and the force that stands behind it. And then concludes by saying the shopping cart is what determines whether a person is a good or a bad member 
of society. And as I said, I've got a little bit of a, a different take on this than, uh, than that. Let me go ahead and put this up as my virtual background behind me real quick since I've mentioned it. There's the text, right? Drops came in. She says, hey, I put a quarter in the shopping cart at Aldi. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys remember? Oh, I can't remember what, what the name of the, of the movie was. It was starring Tom Hanks, and he was, a, he was a person that was in the midst of traveling, and he got stuck at the airport uh, on, on the occasion that his country, his, the country that he, he lived in, um, ceased to exist. So he, he became a... Um, a, a virtual homeless person. Let me adjust that that fade right there. I was, I was disappearing, <laughs> and he he managed to get money to, to 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 buy food from the vending machines and stuff like that by going and gra gathering all the trolleys and taking them back. Because in some circumstances, people just find it more convenient to go. Yeah, you got a dollar from me. There it is, and I'm not going to go back and, and and bother with that terminal. That's it. Eric Williams got it. Terminal. Terminal. That's the one. Yeah. And he was he was he was from, from for some country that while he was in the middle of traveling got overthrown. His original country doesn't exist, and he has nowhere to go. Nobody recognizes his 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 visa. He can't go anywhere from there, and he's stuck at the airport terminal. All right. So that was one of those special circumstances where yeah, he was able to get money by by returning shopping carts because people were just not inclined to go and return them themselves. Oh. I have a little bit of a different take on the on the shopping cart theory, and that is, it's not necessarily a determination of whether or not a person is good or not. I have reasons for returning the shopping cart that have absolutely nothing to do with me being a good person. I know that if I don't return shopping carts and I don't encourage other people to, re to return shopping carts, then there'll be a, a host of shopping carts littered around the, the parking lot which may inflict damage to my vehicle or to other people's vehicles, which costs me money. I have to pay to have the, the dings and the scratches repaired or just live with the fact that I've got a beat up old vehicle that's been scratched and dented by shopping carts that have been left abandoned in the shopping in, in the in the parking lot. Well, that's that's one possibility. The other possibility is, of course, the owner of the shop is going to have to send one of his employees out from inside. One of the employees that was busy ringing up sales at the cash register, which I don't want to do. I know there's such thing as an automated checkout, but I really don't like them. Or stocking the shelves would be another thing that an employee that, that, that would be working at the establishment would be doing. And the owner would have to send one of these people out there to wrangle all the shopping carts and bring them in. Well, I can't go back there and stock the shelves because I'm not an employee, but I can return a shopping cart. So if I return a shopping cart, this means the owner does not have to send somebody out to go collect it. Likewise, if this is a regular occurrence, the owner is going to have to hire somebody to wrangle shopping carts, or at least that's going to be a part of the reason why they hired this person. That, of course, means that the cost of hiring that employee is a cost that I, as a customer, am going to have to absorb. Now, the people at the at the airport in the in the movie terminal obviously were willing to pay the money to get the shopping cart and not worry about returning it because they had places to do things places to go and things to do and going back and returning those trolleys was going to be an inconvenience where they figure yeah somebody will get the money for it that's a little bit of a different circumstance whenever i'm out in a in a in, in a retail establishment or a grocery store and i've got these shopping carts that i'm i, I have the opportunity to go collect um drops to say i just think it's giving someone a job right and, and some people will say well yeah you've you, there are people who are paid to collect these shopping carts right and it, in, in their minds well i'm leaving this shopping cart it just is job security for the person that needs to to, to to be hired to go collect the shopping cart so just saying well if you don't return the shopping cart then then you're you're, you're a savage beast and an animal and you have to be forced by 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 a law and violent force to to do the right thing. I don't think it really applies. Um, oh, <laughs> the only place I don't is at Walmart, and they don't hire enough. To, yeah, really, I haven't. Oh, okay, so I, I I had occasion to go through Walmart not too long ago. I wasn't going there for myself, but I, I had a friend that needed to go to the store, and they wanted to go to Walmart, and so we went to Walmart, and I got to see what it looks like at Walmart, and I was like, oh my gosh. It's 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 
it's gotten worse since the last time I've been uh, since I've been last time I've been there. It's been oh years since I've gone shopping at Walmart. The time about the time that they decided that they were not going to sell firearms to people under the age of twenty one. So when I said, okay, yeah, you know what, I, I don't want to, I don't want to give you my business anymore. My daughter should have, should have been able to to go to Walmart and purchase her her first shotgun of her own instead of just borrowing borrowing her dad's. <laughs> she, she turned eighteen and she was not allowed to at Walmart because of Walmart changing their policy. Now, if if Walmart had had said, yeah, you know what, there's too many problems with selling firearms and we just don't want to be involved with them or we're not going to offer firearms anymore, hey, I can respect that. But because they decided to practice age discrimination, I figured, you know what. I can't stop you from doing that, but I don't have to shop here either. Drop says, I put the shopping cart in the shopping cart collection area. Me too, usually. Usually. Not always, but you know, I, I understand that you know, there are people that get paid to do it. Usually, I, I, I will try to at least put them in the collection area to make their job a little bit easier. They don't have to run all over the place trying to grab a cart. But what I'm referring to, of course, is enlightened self-interest. If, if I'm taking my cart and I'm putting it back in the corral, I'm protecting my vehicle, potentially protecting other people's vehicles from being damaged by the carts. I am reducing the, the, the stress on the worker, which is going to lead to a better shopping experience for me and for everyone else, uh, potentially reducing the need for the shop owner to hire additional personnel to take care of these things, which is going to lead to lower prices for me and everyone else. Or at least I won't be paying for the extra employee. For the same reason, and I gave my father a lecture on civic responsibility when I was 17 years old. Um, my mother and my father were divorced when I, were, when I was, uh, I think, six months old. Uh, difference of opinion upon how to spend the family fortune. He wanted to open up a bar. She didn't want to do that. And they had an argument over it. And eventually they wound up splitting up and going their separate ways. Um, whenever I was 17, I got to meet him and spend some time with him and on a, a trip to the, to the convenience store. And this was in a day and time where it's, they still had the cigarettes out where a person could just reach up and palm one. Um, he went through the line and he palmed cigarettes, put them in his, in, in his pocket. And on the way out, he pulls them out and goes, you shoplifted those. He goes, yeah. Well, they're so expensive, right? I said, well, yeah, but you see, the thing is, whenever you do that, the store owners had to pay for those. Well, they make plenty of money. True, they make plenty of money. Well, they make a certain percentage. But whenever they lose money to theft, they have to recoup those losses somehow. And the way they recoup those losses is by raising the prices on everything else. And there are some things that we just can't go and shoplift, you know, and we have to buy them, not only us, but everybody else who's a customer at the shop, including the people who are who either are unwilling to shoplift or don't have the skill necessary to do it with, with, with that deafness that you demonstrated that 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 classic palm with. Um, it's detrimental. Ultimately, it's self-defeating. So it's, it's working against our self-interest to engage in shoplifting. I don't know if I had him convinced, but. I was pretty certain of the the strength of my argument. I wasn't trying to argue against the morality of it. I wasn't trying to convince them that there was some God that was going to look at him and go, you're a bad person. You're stealing. You're going to go to hell for that. None of that. Simply the logical conclusion that it is in your self-interest to avoid certain types of behavior because the, the, the knock-on effects afterwards will definitely affect you and everyone else around you. Let me see. Mark. <laughs> I steal the cards and sell them for some quick cash. I don't believe you, sir. <laughs> oh. So it drops the same as learning on a 22 at age seven. It's about safety and learning responsibility early. Well, how do we get on that? <laughs> a car or a cart, no different from a 22. Well, you can do, you, you can certainly do damage with them. 
Um, anyway. Brian says that's called shrinkage. Exactly. Okay. That, that, that is exactly the term that is used by retailers for loss due to theft. They, they call it shrinkage. Hmm. We have a, um, we have a, a restaurant chain here in, uh, in this five state area, Oklahoma, Arkansas, uh, Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. Those, these, these five states, it's called Brahms ice cream and dairy stores. Their primary product, of course, is ice cream, and they have uh, a little, little shopping area where you can get some some basic things like you know your your milk and your cheese and your eggs and bread and bacon and stuff like that. Um, but their their primary business, as I said before, it's, it's selling ice cream, and you have to get out there and dip the ice cream with the dippers and put it on the on the cones. There's a, there's a set amount size of the dip that you're supposed to make, how much goes into a shake, all that other stuff, but interesting thing about ice cream is if the temperature gets too high then it starts to melt and as it melts the little air bubbles in between the ice crystals collapse and it causes a, a loss of volume it's still the same weight but you, you you have a loss of volume and due to the loss of volume of ice cream whenever it, it's mishandled, they refer to all of their product losses as shrinkage. Although that's technically not the right term. Shrinkage is lost due to theft. But uh, I don't know how many I should get off on that tangent. Uh, okay, drop to say, I work for Safeway during college. Hate to tell you how many fools I hauled upstairs waiting for the cops to show up. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's just... But even, okay, even assuming that you're going to be able to get away with shoplifting every single time, it still has that negative consequences go, not consequence going forward because it does require that the shopkeeper either raise prices on the things that they can keep from being stolen, hire extra security, like you know you worked extra security work for security. If they didn't have to hire a guy to work security, then that's an expense that wouldn't have to be passed on to the consumer. Or, of course, in extreme cases, the shop has to actually close up. And there are places in, in, in several cities where you can point out and go, yeah, there used to be a grocery store over there, but they kept on getting robbed. People kept on walking out the door with the product, and they couldn't stay in business. As a result, the people who live in the neighborhood that could have visited that, that grocery store and, and been served by that grocery store wind up having to spend more time, more energy, and more effort to go further and further away from their homes to go visit a grocery store. So the, the impacts of, 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 of theft uh, are, are, broad, are, are, are broad reaching, is what I'm trying to get at. And of course, refraining from those activities serves one's self-interest. So it does not necessarily mean that you're a good person that, that obeys the rules, simply that you understand that there are natural consequences to, to doing things like that. Premise doesn't account for snow and ice in the winter when the lot isn't clear, right? Or whenever you're, you're 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 old and infirm, and it's hard to do all that 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 extra walking back and forth. You know, some some elderly people just may wind up leaving carts next to their cars simply because it's 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 too hard on the feet and the knees, and they were kind of struggling to get to the car in the first place. Um. <laughs> How far could you coast a cart back in the day? Uh, pretty far. Um, I can still coast a cart pretty far. <laughs> um, anyway, Ken says, it seems like the measure of good citizenship and general politeness. After all, if we were all stop at being at being the minimum of polite to each other, the world's going to get pretty, eh, pretty bad pretty fast. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's 20 minutes in. I've already talked about the the, the the nuance I wanted to talk about, which is, you know, it's not necessarily the, the measure of goodness and morality, but simply an understanding of, of really the complex relationships that we have with everything in the world around us. A while back, I started talking about um, looking at the things that are, that are existing in the garden, in nature, and trying to develop an understanding of what everything is for, what everything does. Um, we look at 
things like poison ivy or or brambles and say, wow, you know, these these are these are pests, these are weeds, or we look at uh, some sort of an insect that, that's come into the into the uh, into the scenario. Maybe it's the blister beetle, maybe it's a grasshopper, and we say, well, this is a pest, this is a problem. And the more I look at this, and the more I think about it, the more I realize this is an erroneous worldview. Looking at the, the 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 brambles and the poison ivy as being undesirable weeds. Granted, an interaction with a bramble or an interaction with poison ivy can be uh, can be uncomfortable or painful, and in some cases, some of these some of these plants that we interact with, or insects or creatures that we interact with that we call pests or weeds, might even be life threatening. But they all serve their purpose. Even the snake in the garden serves a purpose. The purpose of the snake in the garden is to deal with the rodent problem, particularly the ones that are burrowed underground. Now, I can have a cat, and I do somewhere around here. <laughs> I've got one inside whose job it is to, to take care of rodents that come into the house that aren't supposed to be here and to take care of snakes that come into the house that aren't supposed to be here, particularly venomous ones. We don't usually have a problem with venomous snakes coming into the house, but it can happen. The cat that lives outside is supposed to be taking care of rodents, but he can only really get them whenever they poke their heads up. A snake, on the other hand, can go into the burrow after the burrowing rodent and get them. So there's that purpose that they serve in the ecosystem. Most of these plants that, we, that we're calling weeds, whenever you don't plant something in the space, nature winds up planting something there for you. And that grows whatever it happens to be, it grows because it's convenient for nature to put something there. Nature needs to have something there so that the so the, the biome operates properly. Every plant puts its roots down into the ground as it photosynthesizes, as it draws carbon dioxide out of the air and sucks up the water vapor through its roots and then uses the energy of the sun to create sugars, glucose. It puts some of that sugar down through its roots out to these organisms in the soil around it, fungi and bacteria. The fungi and bacteria feed on that sugar that's released by the plant and in exchange for that sugar they're also drawing in the other nutrients that the plant requires in order to grow so ideally you want to have every square foot planted with something with roots in the ground feeding the soil at all times if you don't have a plant in mind that's going there nature's going to put one in there and the one that nature puts in there may not necessarily be the one that you want but that doesn't make it bad either the trick of course is to figure out what to do with your weeds do you, do you regard them as a problem or do you regard them as a resource? Better than I was just saying, speaking of politeness, don't recall seeing so much road rage in the old days. Uh, I think it had, that also the instance, instance of road rage has to do with the, the overall stress level that human beings are under in most circumstances. We're talking about people living in cities, which is a really unnatural environment for people to be living in. If humans are living in a natural environment, we're a lot more relaxed, we're a lot more calm. Uh, we aren't always rushing, trying to get from point A to point B. We can do things like, okay, let's take a beat. Uh, do, is it that important that I get to that lane at this particular time? It's, it's a, a lot less stressful, I think. And the stress that people are under causes them to act a little crazy sometimes. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure what the purpose of wood ticks is other than to feed birds. <laughs> Maybe that's what they're for. Maybe they're there to feed the birds. Mark says we had a bunch of bunnies all over the house from a hole in the cage. Oh, joy. Were you able to capture them all or are they still out running about? We had uh, an incident with the, uh, with the little duckies not too long ago. I had been out getting poultry netting. <clears throat> Pardon me. Pollen. Yeah. I've been out getting poultry netting so I could set up a little a little fence around the duck hut. And they were out of the uh, out of the one inch, so I got the two inch. I figured, well, you know, the, the, the first two ducks that we got from the farmer's market were big enough that they could be inside of a, a pen with two inch poultry netting. That would hold them just fine. And um I had that set up all around and they've been enjoying that for a while and i decided you know it would be nice to let the, the little ducklings that we just got a couple of weeks ago to have some outdoor time 
and they look like they're large enough that that two inch netting should hold them. It shouldn't be a problem. They might be able to get their, their, their heads through it or something like that, but they'll figure out they can't get anywhere soon enough and it'll be fine. Well, it turns out <laughs> that, that those little ducklings are, are quite agile at getting through small spaces. And in a matter of minutes after I had let them come out into the yard that I had fenced in with the two inch poultry netting, they had managed to completely until they escape from the enclosure and they were all over the place. They, some of them went out further into the backyard. Some of them went out into the front yard and we have some stray cats that are wandering around the neighborhood. So they were in danger of becoming something's lunch. Uh, fortunately, I was eventually able to wrangle them all up and gather them and guide them into the place where they're supposed to go, get them back up the ramp and into the, into the, uh, the duck hut and uh, put the partition up again so they couldn't escape. But I've since gone and picked up uh, the one inch netting that we should have had in the first place. I had to go uh, a little bit further afield to get it because they still don't have it in stock at the uh, at the store nearby. Uh, the supply chain issues are 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 ha having an impact upon being able to to set up and uh, and grow ducks and chickens and things like that. That we just don't have the, the the chicken wire anymore. <laughs> like a bunch of razor blades will chew up everything. They'll go after your uh, your nitrogen fixtures first, though. Mark is saying the mycorrhiza addition this year to his garden has made huge improvements. That's awesome. I think I became a, a real believer that that first year because I've been using it in the in the seedling star. So you, you remember, this is the first year of, uh, of Shed Wars. Uh, I'd used it in the seedling starts and had, had already inoculated all those with uh, with mycorrhizal inoculant. And then whenever I hardened the plants off and then went and transplanted them and expecting that, that that spring was was here and everything's fine because the temperature had gone up and and then right around i guess it was right just before easter sunday or that that same weekend we got our, our hard freeze and it killed off just about everything i had just planted um those plants were able to recover even though they were even though they were killed back to the roots they were able to recover and they still produced that year it's actually a pretty good harvest of uh cayenne peppers i got uh about a pound and a half dry still from that from that uh, from that harvest, and since then, yeah, I don't think I I don't think I'd want to grow a garden without having having uh, mycorrhizal fungi in it. So that's you know the reason for keeping those roots down in the ground at all times. Can say it depends if I have a use for the weed, I suppose. Plant is a weed that you want, and weed is a plant that you don't. Uh, yeah, well, typically any plant, that, any plant that you didn't intend to plant that winds up growing, growing anyway, is either you would call it a volunteer or a weed. But uh, the thing to do with those weeds, if they're not something that you're going to be growing to eat, for example, I've got, uh, I've got curly dock and lamb's quarter, which are volunteers. And ordinarily, yeah, they'd be weeds, but uh, they're edible. And so we incorporate them into the diet and we go out there and harvest them and we use the leaves from the uh, from the lamb's quarter as a spinach substitute. And I don't plant spinach. We use the uh, the, the the stems as a, a substitute for asparagus. Well, they're still young and tender. You steam them and they're, they're, they're edible. The dock greens we use as a as a, a substitute for other greens that you might have, like like turnip greens or collard greens, things of that nature. And so they're still useful. Whenever the dock goes to goes to seed, I cut off the seed tops and I give those to the ducks, and they love those. So all of these things that that that, like, that show up like that, I can utilize as a resource. But it's not limited to that. I can also cut these these weeds down. And since most of these are really good at extracting minerals and, and such stuff like that from the subsoil, those weeds now what they that they've been cut become a beneficial soil amendment so i cut them and i just lay them down on the ground and they become a mulch on the ground and as the as they decay they take those minerals that they mined 
and put them back in the soil surface. So those weeds are a resource. Brian says, what? Going to go eat a Reuben sandwich and watch the new James Bond movie. All right. I can't blame you for going to eat a Reuben sandwich. Reuben sandwiches are delicious. I like mine with mustard, by the way. I know the the classic recipe says using the use the Thousand Island dressing. I like mustard on mine. Drops the same out. Seventy percent of all plants on the planet are edible. Just about, yeah, most of them. How many are tasty? Well, that's a different story, right? Uh, doc is not bad if you eat it. If you eat it, uh, if you eat it fresh, it's got a kind of a, a an acidic, tart, lemony sort of flavor to it. A little, you know, it's a little bitter. Uh, whenever you cook it, that that bitterness goes away. Lamb's quarter is pretty. Yeah, it's, it's 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 just an edible green. There are some other things that you can eat that I don't really have a, a great appreciation for. I never did really appreciate dandelion leaves. I think they're a little bit too bitter, but you know. If you cooked them, that would go away too. Mm. Kim was asking, what inoculants have I used and might recommend? Okay. Well, on the shelf behind me on the other side of the green screen, I've got, uh, I think it's called Wild Root is the name of the, the company that produced it. Wild Root Organics. That's, uh, that's one of the first ones I use. And I got another one. Um, got another one from England for uh, for ericaceous plants because I wanted to make sure I had something that would be able to interact with my um, interact with my uh, what am I saying my willow and my um, wintergreen and my blueberries because those are all partially ericaceous. Yeah, willows are 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 are, are able to form associations with ericaceous fungi as well as uh, the, the ectomycorrhizal, I mean, the same thing that interacts with your, your nut trees. So if you have plants like the willow or, uh, let's see, that's another good example of it. Um, no, I'm a liar. Willow is not, willow is not ericaceous. Wintergreen is. Okay, so, okay, let me get this straight. The wintergreen is both ericaceous and, and, and ectomycorrhizal. And then the willow is uh, able to associate with the wintergreen through through the ectomycorrhizal uh, pathway. In any case, I got two different types. I wanted to make sure I had an association, uh, a couple of uh, arbusco mycorrhizal fungi and uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi. And then I added in the ericaceous mycorrhizal as well. Um, and as far as bacteria goes, as long as you're getting sugars into the soil, you're going to wind up with bacteria. We could say as many plants that are edible when they're young and tender are not otherwise like poke, for example. I know some people will eat poke when it's, once the stems start to go red, but I don't because I don't I don't want to try it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Can extract salt from some roots. There are several plants you can extract salt from. Um, hickory, for example. I think, yeah, you were saying that. Hey, what are you doing? Hickory, dandelion, walnut, pecan roots. All, all those ones that produce juggalone. Go figure. Uh, there's also salt bush and uh, uh, salasola soda, uh, or the barilla plant, uh, which are uh, the barilla plants, uh, an, an annual, and salt bush, which, of course, is a perennial uh, that you can grow to mine salt out of the soil. Am I a stone ground mustard guy? Well, I guess. I mean, my, the mortar and pestle that I use for grinding mustard is, uh, it is stone. Um, usually I don't, I, I don't prepare it with, with the, with the, uh, the vinegar and oil as a, as a condiment. I just add it as a seasoning. Hmm. But I only eat, I only eat um, prepared mustard whenever I have something like like corned beef to put it on, or hot dogs, or uh, sausages and stuff like that. 
Kay says she prefers mustard over a thousand island too for, for her Rubens. See, there you go. I like making a sandwich with mustard and pepperoncini peppers and regular bell peppers, onions, um, and um, pastrami. So you, you take your pastrami, you put it in the skillet with all your all of your uh, all your, your veggies, and then you, you get it all cooked up together so that your, your onions start to caramelize and your peppers become nice and tender, and then you add a little bit of mustard there as you're finishing off, and that goes right on your toasted bread, maybe a little bit of toasted rye. Oh man, that's it's just so tasty. <laughs> We had a, a, a shop here in town that used to make those. Let's see here. Elderberry. What about elderberry? Um, elderberry is good for, for, uh, for putting sugars into the ground. It's, it promotes fermentation. It pr promotes the... The, the growth of bacteria more so than several other things do. Mm -hmm. I got some mustard seed from Mark that, I, that I'm growing this year. So it's, uh, we're going to find out how well it works. They're, uh, they're, they're in the green stage right now. Marcus, I would be interested in seeing sugar content under fruit trees in the fungal networks. Well, that that would be a pretty cool uh, project to, to to get into. Actually, showing uh, how much sugar is being put in by by different types of plants, so we can actually have a list of well, which plants are are pumping out the most sugars. Just like the, the project I want to do, which which is where we we get a controlled sampling of soils, so we know exactly what's in the soil as far as minerals go. And then we plant into it things that we assume are are, are are dynamic accumulators for various minerals and then find out how much they uptake in reality as compared to other plants that usually aren't considered dynamic accumulators does everything uptake minerals at the certain certain at the same degree provided that ph is appropriate uh could it be that some plants are better accumulators than others simply because they alter the pH in the root zone. Maybe that's the reason why they become dynamic accumulators. And of course, also in, in the same in the same vein, we can we can look at uh, at soil samples after plants have uh, have been grown in it to see, uh, yeah, what kind what kind of what kind of situation we're looking at as far as sugars go, or do we have certain plants that put out more sugar than other? And that would be worthwhile, I think. Because we can, if we can find out the best plants to plant um, to, to maximize soil life, um, our gardens will be a, a whole lot better. Elderberry is not edible, just like well, yeah, yeah. The, okay, so the plant itself isn't edible at all. It's incidentally, plant the elderberry plant. If you if you harvest the uh, if you harvest the leaves of that and, and mash them up, you can create a tea um, using a fusion of hot water, make, make a tea out of the leaves and use that as a spray for retarding uh, fungal growth. For example, your powdery mildew and, and other, other fungal problems that you might be having and also as a, uh, as a pesticide as well, which is kind of groovy. Drops is growing some wasabi. I'm growing horseradish. I don't know if I don't know if I can I can I can make was is wasabi an entirely different plant or is it just a, a, a variation of horseradish? That's what I want. <laughs> it says I got blueberries layered with pecan. I do too, as a matter of fact. I, I, I put I put the blueberries out there and I've planted and I need to get more wintergreen because most of it didn't survive. I got a little bit that made it. It's just simply because I don't have enough canopy coverage at the moment for the for the wintergreen to, to be happy. Uh, but I put in the wintergreen as the bridge between the pecan and the hazelnut and the, the blueberries. And ordinarily in, in, in a naturally occurring forest, you'll wind up with uh, with pines, members of, 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 the, of the genus Panacea being that bridge. Uh, well, at least as far as being the canopy 
in that area. And pines are good for, for dropping needles, which do help increase, uh, actually it's decreased soil pH, which makes it more acidic. Uh, but the ericaceous plants tend to like it. So you'll see, you'll see blueberries, rhododendrons, wintergreens, and then pines together. But uh, they can function right alongside hazelnut and pecan just as well. And it's the it's the it's the ericaceous mycorrhizal fungi that enable that association to happen. So once these fungal networks develop, they wind up taking sugars in from from one tree that's, that's doing a lot of photosynthesis, and that's the unit of exchange that they use in that network. And I'm pretty sure the fungi are doing this out of their own self interest. They're doing they're doing it for survival purposes. Kind of like the reason why I would return a shopping cart, not because they, they, they have some sort of vested interest in the in, in the, the health and survival of the forest for purely altruistic reasons. No, they're 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 serving their self-interest by doing this. So they keep everything else alive and functioning. They'll get maybe they'll get a a molecule from this this plant over here that's going to be useful for another plant over here for fighting off pests. So they're going to pass that along through the net. And they're going to get the sugars from this plant and go, hey, you're doing a good job over here pumping out that molecule that we need. So we're going to feed you with the sugars, even though you can't photosynthesize as much as you would be ordinarily, you're still okay and you're still going to be able to produce fruit. That fruit, of course, provides sugars up here at the surface level, which is going to be feeding other life. That other life, of course, turns that into nitrogen and from their manure, which also feeds the soil. So there's all kinds of complex interactions that occur beyond just the, 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 the bare surface level. Uh, that happen in a natural forest. What she said. <laughs> I've looked at it, I was like, uh... So Drops is growing it every year. Right. So the, the, the horseradish that I'm growing Incidentally, it, it puts out really big, I don't know if anybody's ever seen it, but it puts out really big leaves, monstrous leaves. And I've been looking at it and going, I kind of want to harvest a little bit of the leaf and, and see if it's got that that sort of greenish mustardish, or not mustard, but the greenish horseradish-ish flavor to it like a wasabi does. And maybe that it, maybe that is what wasabi is, is a variation of mustard, or not mustard, but a variation of horseradish. Joe Serrano in the house. Hey, Joe, guess what I got? You'll never guess what I got. I got I got something. I got something. Check it out. Check it out. Oh, my goodness. We're going to be making our own tortillas. <laughs> so you're welcome to stop by. We will have homemade tortillas for you, buddy. Um, we got, we've been going... To this this new place called El Nahue, uh over here in Sand Springs, and uh, they, they make they make homemade tortillas there too, and they've got me hooked. <laughs> I can't I can't I can't eat the I can't eat the store bought ones anymore. Let's see. Drops wants to start a seed company. That sounds cool. You're going to need a lot of uh, space to grow, to grow different seeds in. Mm. At least to be able to isolate things. Either that, just don't devote yourself to growing one type of, you know, <laughs> one type of, one type of pepper. So you don't wind up with a, with an accidental hybrid. All right, so that the seeds that you got for your for your wasabi you got from True Leaf three three years ago. That's cool. So you're getting you're getting uh, horse. You have both. You have both horseradish and wasabi. Then nice. I've been trying to get. Uh, Vicky is educating me here. 
but I've been trying to get uh, Turkish rocket to grow. It's kind of a, like a perennial cabbage. It's a perennial leaf cabbage. Um, we got pak choy that I've noticed that it goes to seed really, really fast here. So we barely got to harvest any of it before it is already just bolting and going and producing seed. We might try it again in the winter or you know, in the fall as we go into winter. All right. So putting on big leaves and all right, cool. Because I only have a little bit. I got I got like four horseradish roots. I just got them started and they're 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 growing now. And I've been looking at them. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, some places people just outright steal the shopping carts, right? But of course, you have you know when you have a situation where people are homeless, they're using them to transport all of their worldly possessions. It's kind of hard to go. That's an evil and bad person that's homeless that's using the shopping cart. It's more of a, a, a situation where people do things out of desperation that they ordinarily wouldn't be doing. Yeah, I know about using the plastic bags. I actually have some. Um, I, I I have I have wax paper too that I can use for it. And yeah, we're gonna make it with our. We're gonna make it with our Indian corn. I'm I'm kind of excited. I didn't have enough to do it last year. I had to use that plain old nasty yellow corn for the next fertilization, and it was okay, but it wasn't very inspiring. Well, this year instead of, uh, instead of using lime, we're gonna use uh, wood ash. And try it with wood ash for next mobilization, and we'll use our actual corn to, to make tortillas with. So hopefully we'll have we'll have happy tummies as we go into winter. Drops is already back with the report. No, no distinguishable taste off a leaf of horseradish about a foot long. Okay. Thanks for the report. Appreciate it. Uh, wow. Do they actually like have, have, have a tracker for the shopping carts? <laughs> it's kind of funny. Whenever I first saw this, this, this example, I was actually thinking about the way people interact in, in grocery stores uh, as far as, as far as pure anarchism goes. Because whenever you're in a grocery store, up until recently, I mean, you know, 2020, 2021, we started seeing them painting little arrows and lines saying, you must go this way down the, down the aisle to, to make sure that people aren't, aren't bumping into each other. Oh, no. We don't want them <coughs> coming into close contact for some reason. But anyway, up to that point, whenever people walked into the grocery store, they grabbed their shopping cart and started going down the aisle and... They would be following their their own particular pattern to get what they needed. Um, everybody operating off of off of their own internal set of rules as far as how they went about doing their shopping. But when it comes to interacting with other shoppers, you didn't see people having collisions where the shopping carts crashed into each other. And usually, people would get their get their things in a nice, neat, and orderly fashion, with the exception of Black Friday sales. You know, those could get crazy. Um, but apparently. Even though there wasn't somebody saying you must push your shopping cart in this direction, you must do these things, people were able to figure out how to interact with each other without somebody there to 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 make the rules and enforce the rules for them. This is all very important if we're going to at one one point in the future establish a civilization on planet Earth that does not have a, a ruling class. No earthly king, we'll put it that way. For some people, this is the end goal of their religion, in all actuality, to establish a civilization on Earth that has no earthly king. For some reason, many of these people still clamor for kings and 
physical rulers. I don't know why. Maybe they just haven't reached that point yet. Um, any case, um, moving on. What is this? Roots on the horseradish grow deep. Joe says wax paper is better for making 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 tortillas. Awesome. It's good. That's that 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 corn that gets like waist high or maybe chest high tops, but still produces full size, full size ears. Mary was doing a video. Yeah, it, she's already put it up there where she was doing this thing like she's like squishing your head. I'm squishing your head. <laughs> she's comparing my height to the height of the corn. She's like, okay, she isn't six foot tall, and the corn is like right there. There's some of it that's taller than I am right now. So it's it, ours is doing pretty good. It's probably going to get to be maybe seven to eight foot, maybe nine on, on the on the top end. Maybe I don't know. We'll we'll find out. Meow. Right, kitty. This is the first year from um, planting the seed that we collected from last year. So it's all all the corn that we're growing this year is land raised. It's used to growing here now. Of course, it was. It was the corn that was originally grown here, so hopefully it should be used to growing here. It's certainly done a lot better than any other corn I've ever grown. Ken said, had to step away for a second, so I needed to catch up on the pecan blueberry connection. I'll leave a couple of volunteer longleaf pine saplings close by. Cool. Uh, eventually, we want to work some pines into our, into our forest here. I can find the room to stuff more trees in. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe a, a a good pine for for producing pine nuts, like a Swiss stone pine or something like that, and we can keep them dwarfed and make them say shrub shrub like pine trees. So we'll have like a little, little Swiss stone pine in there from from place to place, so we can get pine nuts. So I'll have the the basil that we like to grow. We've got a land race basil that I've got planted all over the place. It volunteers itself now too. And we grab those, we harvest those, we take our our, our salad oil maybe from the safflower and so we'll have a we'll have a nice oil and the, the basil leaf and then we'll use the pine nuts and we can make pesto i think that will be fun <laughs> shopping carts are amazing sturdy and useful uh i wonder why though why would they be so expensive? Let's see here. Occasionally, whenever I scroll down, it scrolls down too far. Let's see. That's what you can say. Giving us giving us a little a little tip here. Instead of wax pepper, we can reuse any plastic cereal liners that you get. It would I would do that, but we don't buy cereal. But that's a good uh, that's a good upcycle tip there. So what Mary is mentioning there is um, the events of. Was it Second Samuel or First Kings? I think it's First Kings. Uh, first and Second Samuel in, 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 in the Bible are talking about how Samuel was called to his particular uh, his particular ministry, but uh, whenever he was he had become an adult and established as a as one of the prophets, the the people were wanting a king because that's what everybody else had and they want to be like all the cool kids. They said, Hey. Everybody else around here has a king. We want to be like everybody else, kind of like you know, here in the United States. Whenever we see people in Europe doing things, we go, "We want to have that thing that they have over there in Europe." You may have seen that sort of tendency. So we notice that they tax their 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 citizenry at you know seventy to eighty percent of their income, and then they provide them with all these goodies, uh, and everybody gets to share and everything. Isn't it wonderful? We want that. But of course, our, our civilization in America is not like everybody else's civilization. You'd have to literally change everything to have it work like that. 
and so it doesn't. And then they wonder, well, we we kind of did it. Why isn't it working? Anyway, so yeah, the the, the, the Jews at the time they wanted to have a king, and they they they, they kept on pushing the Samuel to go anoint one for them. And he told them, you're, "You're okay. Let me tell you what kind of king you're going to wind up with. <laughs> let me break it down to you. He's going to take the best of your crops for himself. He's going to he's going to uh, to take your your young men to serve in his armies to drive his chariots. He's going to take the young women to work for for him, and you will be slaves to him. That's the kind of king you're going to wind up with because that's all kings ever do. But they kept on pushing, and they wound up with a king." The idea is we want to get away from having a, a, a physical worldly king. And uh, I don't know exactly how that transition is going to take place, but I do know that uh, we have to develop a civilization that's capable of returning shopping carts <laughs> before we can get there. Talking about the uh, horse rash. Yeah, I got mine at uh, at Atwoods. I was walking through there, saw it, and went, oh, okay. Yeah, I would like to have some. Let's see. So Joe says there's a Costco near where he lives. Wow. You're, you're in one of those rich, ritzy places and afford to have a Costco. <laughs> yeah, so the Costco, here's look at next to a mall, and a few of the Costco shoppers borrow the cart and leave it at the mall. Hmm. Why don't they get a, what is it, Suriana cart? I'm looking from the Costco and into it. Laziness? Hmm. Okay, so I, was told, I was totally mistaken. It's it's a sweet. Oh, okay, I've heard of Bantam sweet corn. Okay, I know what you're talking about now. I was thinking Bantam is in small. Yeah. MK Church wants to see the kitty. Hey kitty. Yeah. Meow. Hey kitty. Yeah. Meow. meow. Yes. Come here. Somebody wants to say hi to you. Come here. Right over here. Right here. Right here. Meow. Yes. Hi. Let me pick you up. Meow. Meow. Yeah. Here we go. Say hi to the people. Say hi to the people. Look up there. Look up there. See, there's a camera up there. Let me look up over there and say hi to the people. Let me say hi. Say hello. Let me say hello. You want to say hello? Hello. Meow. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Meow. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't put food out for you tonight. Try to bribe her with food, you know, late in the evening, so she won't come and be a nuisance. Let's see. Let's see. So there's some sweet corn was specifically hybridized to be sweet. I don't think it was necessarily hybridized to be sweet. I, I believe that the sweetness is. Uh, Sweetness is in the original corn genome at some point, or it was a mutation. I don't know whether it was there to begin with and it was isolated out, or if it was a mutation that occurred and somebody said, Ooh, hey, this one's sweet or sweeter than, than normal. Because, I mean, even, even, even flower corn is a little sweet whenever it's still fresh and um, particularly whenever it's younger. Um, so I'm not entirely certain how we wound up with sweet corn. I've seen a little bit of yellow pop up in, in ours, so I know that gene is in there somewhere, but it's not very common. Like maybe one ear out of one ear out of a hundred will have some yellow kernels in it. Let's see. So nice and fresh in the field. Yeah, the raccoons love it. <laughs> if 
well, that's an idea. Um, chances are you can you can dry out sweet corn if you get it, if you get like it if you get it on the cob, right? And, it, and it's, it's fully ripe whenever you get to the store. You might be able to allow it to dry and then plant it and grow it, but I don't know. I think flower corn is more valuable. Sweet corn, sweet corn is nice. It's a treat, but you've got to grow. You, you still have to grow it in, in, in the same concentration that you would grow your flower corn in, so that everything gets cross pollinated. And the question is, do I really want to? devote that much garden space to having sweet corn. You are welcome. <laughs> I can occasionally get the cat to come over whenever I call her. It's whenever she comes over when I haven't called her and I'm trying to do something else that becomes a problem. Uh, So yeah, fresh Indian corn on the cob, you should be able to, to 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 dry it in and plant it. I mean, that's that's how I got my seed. Was harvesting the harvesting the Indian corn and hanging it up, letting it dry, and then I, I shuck the shuck the kernels off and then planted them, and I got uh, almost one hundred percent germination, which is pretty good. Let's see. Arkansas is wanting to know, Mark wants to know, how many generations to get an all solid color kernel or a speckled pattern? That's a good question. Um, most of what I planted this year, as a matter of fact, as far as I know, all of what I planted this year is speckled white and purple. But there's a couple variations in there. Uh, so I'm, I'm planting what eventually would be in pure geographic isolation, what eventually would turn into white eagle corn. Because that's, you know, that's, that's more of a Cherokee thing. Um, but we'll see how many, how many red and red and, and dark purple, uh, ears pop up. I'm sure we're going to get some that show, show up, uh, red and dark purple as well. And who knows, we might even get a pure white. Uh, if you were selecting, like just going through and look for only the ears that have the, have the color that you're looking for and only taking those kernels that are the color that you're looking for only planting those probably about three or four generations will get you fairly close but every time you're getting a, a narrower and a more more and more narrow gene pool which means that uh, your, your chances of having pest problems and and uh, uh, disease problems and stuff like that increase as you as you get closer and closer to having a, a pure strain Most dry beans in the store you can soak in water for a couple of days and plant too. Yeah, I mean the uh, you know the beans that they found uh, sealed away in a clay pot at Mesa Verde that had been there for uh, probably hundreds of years before they they unearthed them. They were able to get the those beans to sprout. Of course, the, the circumstances there were a a fairly constant temperature, dry, kept in the dark. Uh, those those circumstances were certainly helpful for saving that seed for an extended period of time, but this just goes to prove how well uh, your, your legumes can survive being stored and then being grown. And of course, the, the beans that you get out of bags at the store, they're all like that. Yep. You can do that with sunflower seed at the feed store or that you get for, for bird feed. The sunflowers that we have growing right now are all, are all from bird seed. Uh, safflower too. We've got safflower growing from birdseed. The peanuts that I'm growing are also birdseed peanuts, but I eat them. I eat those. Um, yep. The series of videos on those last year. I'll probably do some more in the future, but I think I fairly covered most of it. It'd be just more, more, more in the same, more in the same vein. The only thing that I had any difficulty getting to sprout and grow from uh, from buying it from the grocery store were uh, seasonings. And I think that's really simply because the, the seasonings are collected so so far back in the past that these seeds, which typically your seasoning seeds, um, don't have a lot of, of 
stored energy in them. Okay, take for example, you've, you've got a, a kernel of corn. It's got a lot of starch in it that can be converted to sugars that provides fuel for the plant to grow with. A bean has a lot of a lot of fuel for the for the plant to grow with. But if you've got just a, a little tiny caraway seed, even if the seed is intact, the germ is there and everything, there's not a whole lot of fuel left. There wasn't a whole lot of fuel to start out with for that seed to grow with, and it has a hard time surviving after it's been sprouted, especially if it's really, really old. And so to date, I have not had any success at getting uh, seasonings, that, I, that se seeds for seasoning that I've planted to grow. Uh, I have got some mustard that I might try, but the, the stuff that I got from Mark is working just fine. So that'll be, if I do it, it's going to be more of a, just an experiment to go, hey, let's see if I can get this stuff to sprout. I, I won't be relying on it. You get your black oil sunflower seeds, plant them for feed, and then you've got all the sunflowers you could possibly need. And peanuts, yeah. Peanuts were really good too. Okay. Uh huh. So you planted some, some, some pinto beans and they didn't come up? Yeah, well, pinto beans are. Are, are interesting because they're so mass produced I and mean, they're, they're they're heavily farmed and then they're stored and the length of time that they're stored and conditions that they're stored in may influence whether or not they were going to germinate as well but getting them getting them soaked well so they absorb the water so they can germinate is important Corn that might do well in a container. It's really hard to get. Uh, I hate to say no, but uh, just the way corn, just the way corn is pollinated, makes it makes it really not suitable for container growing. Um, you really need to have at least four rows of corn in a block, four by four, so like sixteen plants close together. Um, Although what you could experiment with is doing a uh, high intensive planting of several corn plants in one container, maybe get yourself a, this would be a good experiment. I might try this out next year, uh, get about maybe a 25 gallon, 20 to 25 gallon container and put maybe six to eight corn plants all together in a clump. So they're all close by each other. So they have an opportunity to cross pollinate and you might be able to get away with doing it that way. But, uh, Not the recommended way of growing corn in any case. But um, uh, sweet potato, it, once again, if, you, if you've got a fairly large container to grow sweet potatoes in, I'm trying it out this year, and I'll let you know uh, how well it works. Um, you are, yeah, okay. You don't necessarily have to use, use exactly this method for, 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 for fertilization. It will work. But uh, yeah, corn is going to need some extra fertility. And if you're growing in a container, the only way it's going to get it is if you feed it. But the main concern I would have is, is that it gets properly pollinated. So uh, plant a clump of corn together, and then whenever they, they're, they're up in tassel, get them and give them a good shake so, so the, the pollen gets down from those tassels to the, to the corn silks to get your corn pollinated. Because if it doesn't get pollinated, it won't form, it won't form corn, corn kernels. But even then, I don't know if you'd want to save the seed from it to plant year after year. You'd have to buy fresh seed every year simply because your genetic diversity is going to be low. Here's <laughs> golden tea for all the plants. There you go. Um, and, and yeah, corn is ordinarily pollinated by the wind. You can't have you can't have bees coming along and butterflies coming along and pollinate your corn for you. So it. it you have to have them close enough that the wind will, will do, do, do the pollination. Or another thing that has been done is uh, people, people have been known to go out there early in the morning whenever whenever the tassels are up and use a paintbrush and gather the pollen with the paintbrush and then paint the corn silks with the paintbrush. And you can use that method too. Uh, if, if you have just fewer plants available, 
so maybe you don't have enough plants that you can plant that good at least four by four block uh, of corn plants and then you can use a paintbrush to transfer your pollen it means you got to do a little extra work but it is possible to do it uh billy is asking did i miss the shopping cart problem topic yeah we, we talked about that in the first 20 minutes or so um as we went into the 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 shopping cart tests for whether or not a, a civilization is capable of self-governance or not and uh and that discussed whether or not this is really an indication of goodness in in a society and i, I think really if humans are in a natural state uh humans are generally good <laughs> unfortunately in in the, the, the circumstances that humans are found most often these days they are not in a natural state, which, of course, is where we wind up with all of our problems. All right. So Vicky is saying she has seen that done, putting the corn into a, into a container and then shaking it for pollination. Oh, yeah. I, I've, I've got that. I've got that. Uh, the, the basic premise there behind me. Let me just do this real quick. There you go. That's the uh, that's the premise of, of, of the test there, right? <laughs> Humans are mostly good, but or are they lazy? Yeah. Uh, Joe's wondering if Hopi sell their corn. Um, I know I've seen Hopi corn for sale, but I don't know, know that it was necessarily grown by the Hopis, if you know what I mean. But yeah, some of that might be really good for, for, for a container. Let me... Uh, find my background here and fade myself back in. Yeah, yeah, I'm back. Here we are. Oh, that's too much. There we go. That's about right. Up in Maine. All right, so up in Maine, you're going to want something that's, that has a really, really short gross, gr growing season or something that you can, uh, maybe something you can start inside and have in a, in a container that you can take outside. That might be, that might work well, as well. Uh, I know, like John Will it Grow is <laughs> experimenting with trying to grow okra and other stuff like that in Maine. It's, there's some there's some things that you know, sweet potatoes, uh, some, a lot of the corn, the you know, the, the, the longer season corns and stuff like that. Okra just not really not really grown a lot up in, up in the frozen north. My daughter's here for uh, for the rest of the month from from Pennsylvania, and she said, Dad. They don't know what okra is in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I think they do. It's just that you're you're, you're going to be limited in the, in the in the varieties that you can grow. There's yeah, there's some that can grow as, as as quickly as eighty days, and especially if you get them started indoors, and you can you you, you can get your, your your corn kernels planted in a in a uh, one of those one of the seed trays to start out with, and then whenever the, the, the weather becomes suitable you can transplant the corn out once again more work but it's it's doable you can do it yeah i've seen i've seen hopi corn for sale i don't know if it's genuine hopi corn i mean maybe <laughs> transport oh as long as they put me most back together most of the right way, it'll be up, it'll be fine. Yeah, the the stuff that I've seen recently was uh, it's it's like a, a blue corn, it's like a turquoise blue and white, which uh, which looks pretty cool. Um, I believe that would have to have to have some kind of a mutation from uh, from the original. Hmm. Drop saying, yeah, okra is 60 days, but those need to be warm days, uh, particularly warm days, like 85, 85 degrees plus. 
whenever they're they're making flowers and making making seed pods. So it may be difficult to get them to get a harvest. They'll grow, but you might might have a hard time getting harvest. Says, but blue Hopi from MI Garden, each pack was supposed to have 20 seeds. Only one pack had the right seed and 12 seeds. Four didn't germinate. Wow. That's so I, I I I don't know. I don't know why you would sell a pack of corn that that small. That's tiny. I mean, I guess that's enough for you to have a assuming. Uh well, no. If only if one one pack only had twelve seeds, it's not even enough to have a four by four block. So that's, I mean, the very minimum you'd need is at least sixteen seeds, right? And I, I would, I would say at least three times that because you want to have enough to overseed and then thin your thin your corn out so you have the right number for at least a small block. Small block should be um, sixteen times three, thirty plus. Uh, 30 plus 18, 48 seeds, 50 seeds. Probably shouldn't sell a pack of corn with anything, anything less than 50 seeds in it. So that's kind of that's kind of disappointing that that Luke that is Luke, right? And my gardener would, would, would sell them like that. Rob asked the all-important question: Have I thought about flax as a food source and clothing? I have. Uh, I, I got interested a couple of years back in uh, Linum Luisi, which is the the perennial blue flax that was encountered by the Lewis and Clark expedition as they as they crossed uh, the continental U.S. on a survey mission, as opposed to a perennial flax. And I've tried growing both. Um, I really wanted the blue stuff because uh, my mother-in-law likes plants with blue flowers. And I figured, hey, we'll, we'll plant flax. It'll have it'll be a perennial. They'll come back year after year. They'll have blue flowers on it. And they produce Fibers that can be used for making textiles. She likes to do uh, crochet and knitting and, and and making lace and stuff like that. So we figured there'll be a nice thing to have growing in the garden there. And of course, you have know, flaxseed, high in vitamin E, um, as as a, as a possible edible in the landscape. I have not had much success at growing flax, but I've thought about it and I've tried to grow it. But I I'm a horrible gardener. In case you haven't, haven't figured that out yet, I can kill just about anything. Four indoor greenhouses. Woohoo. That's pretty good. Uh, the the grow tents. And yeah, people use use those for weed quite often. It's not why I was looking over here. I have a grow tent over here. Well, what's left of a grow tent? I just I disassembled it this year. Um, I was growing peppers indoors and now I've, I've I've converted a space in in the utility room for for bringing our, our pepper, pepper plants in for the winter and I want to set up an outside uh, greenhouse to keep them because I want to be able to keep a few more pepper plants and just one or two. Uh, but yeah, sometimes I, I wonder whenever people go by late at night and they see that that purple light, oh, do they think, hmm, is he growing pot in there? And no, we're not growing pot in here. Yeah, I've got a I've got a dwarf ochre that we're trying out this year, and they are not going to get big, but hopefully they'll produce a lot. <laughs> They're trying to get every single square foot that they can planted. <laughs> Got to be careful putting your hand out the window close to a cornfield, though. Those 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 leaves are sharp. Yeah. Well, you know, where you're at, you don't necessarily have enough really hot days for it. Dallas saying, got 10 silver fir tomato seeds from Luke with zero germination. Oh, no. And one pack only had three. How does that happen? I, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out how that even happens. I've got, I don't know, maybe he's doing something else, but 
I was, I was just looking around. I think I moved them to the back room. I, I've got packages for putting seeds in whenever I start putting seeds up for sale on our website. I don't know how I would manage to get a pack with only, you know, three seeds or 12 seeds in it. I don't know how that happens. So Joe's down there in, in Old Mexico has got the, the the more traditional Mexican red corn. It says it gets to be about six foot tall. I got a little bit of red. I haven't tried isolating it yet. I think what I want to do is uh, save all of my red and black corn, you know, the, the, the odd stuff, and just put it aside and hold on to it and keep the critters out of it. And then whenever I have enough, I can plant an entire an entire block. It, with that corn, I'll plant an entire block and we'll see what we get. I know the uh, the, the Pawnee uh, have, have a close association with the speckled red that, that, I can, that I can get some of, and I might be able to to send some their way because they're 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 losing some of the genetic diversity of their their heritage corn. So John over there, really gross. The Azorian corn gets between 10 to 12 foot. I'd be kind of interested in finding out more about corn from, from the Azores because that's all the way on the other side of the Atlantic, right? Like, when did it arrive on the island? How long have they been growing it? Who did they get it from? Um, Is there anything special about it? Does it have particular traits that are interesting? My, usually it's my back room. But I try the time the lights so they're only on during the day. So about the time the sun's coming up, they come on. And about the time the sun's going down, they, they turn off. And that way it's not too much of a it's not too much of a distraction. But the neighbor over there, uh, next door, his grow lights are for growing hemp. He's got the card; it's legal. <laughs> Keep the critters up. Um, I get, I get these. Um, um large 30 gallon uh plastic containers that have have lids that you you, you screw on they have screw on lids with latches and it's pretty heavy duty uh hdp plastic so the, the the rats aren't chewing through it anytime soon but i can get about 30 30 gallons of volume in each one and i've got a dozen or so though probably i'll get a few more of them and those, those do a pretty good job of keeping the critters out. You just have to make sure everything's dried well before they go in. And then um, I can I can do things like put them outside. And then whenever it gets cold enough during the winter, if there was any insects trying to overwinter inside the inside the grains that are there, hopefully that will kill them off. I haven't had any problems yet. Ooh, green chilies and butter on the corn. Yum, yum. Uh, Vicky's asking if I've tried the bone sauce yet. I have not. I still have it sitting right here on the desk. Marcus trying silver queen, candy corn, mountain gem, trucker, and Wahana green, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. That's a pretty cool looking corn, though, by the way, that, that, that green stuff. All the way down th from the very, 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 very bottom of Mexico and has a really long growing season, but it's a really cool looking corn.
I have not tried corn smut yet, Joe, because I don't have that much. <laughs> usually about the time, usually about the time our, our, our corn is, is is filling out, is it's getting into the, into our dry season. And uh, as a result, we don't have enough enough really uh, moisture to, to support the growth of, of, of the, that, those kind of fungi. I see a little bit of it popping up here and there, but not, not really enough to do anything with. Yeah. Yes, it is green. It's like a green and, and like dark green and, and lighter green. It's like, it's like two-tone dark and light green. And it's uh, it gets big, like really big plants. Long growing season. Though. Gardener definition, Billy says. Someone who likes torture. A person that enjoys growing to feed the local bug and animal population while praying it rains while dancing. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. Saw some clouds out today. I thought, hmm. Yeah, the forecast doesn't say anything about rain, but I wouldn't mind some. Uh, I, I, I curse the humidity whenever we get it, right? So whenever it's whenever it rains, it gets really humid. And now, now we have you know any temperature over eighty five or so plus humidity, and it just it's miserable out here. But uh, but it's nice to have the rain too, all the same. And MK Church is heading off to bed, and I think I should too. We've been on here for about an hour and a half. Talking, of course, about the shopping cart problem. Can we build and develop a civilization that does not need to be violently controlled by sociopaths and psychopaths? Which is really what we're, 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 we're getting down to now. It's becoming more and more apparent. No matter where you're living on this, living on this great, big, wide, wonderful 57 million square mile garden surrounded on all four sides by water, wherever that happens to be, um, the worst people are in charge, and unfortunately, for most of us, we are allowing ourselves to grow up, grow up, and 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 grow in civilizations that uh, that seem to require somebody to come along and violently issue orders. Um, developing that ability to live without them is, uh, of course, going to be necessary for the gardens of the future. In any case, guys, I'm going to head off to bed because you know starting to get all squinty-eyed. As always, I hope you found the video informative or entertaining. Maybe a little bit of both. And if you did, you know what to do. I'll catch you next time. And until then, get out there and get growing. <laughs>